Welcome to the fifth annual symposium for the digital person 2022. It has been a while uh, since 2020 since we had this. So uh, I remember the last time it was in September. And since that time, I think quite a lot of the world has changed around us. So I'd like to welcome everyone here. Um, I am in very sunny and warm Kuala Lumpur. Uh, my team is in various parts of the world organizing this. So I want to thank, thank them very much for um, getting this up and, and going. It's going to be an exciting day. Um, it has been an exciting uh, two years. So what I want to do is to start to give you an update on what's been happening in the HAT ecosystem. I know that some of you have been following us on this journey since we started back in 2015, actually some as, as far back as 2014, I think. Um, so it's been quite a journey. I have to say, say thank you to everyone who's followed us. Um, it is exciting uh, for us, um, I think this year more than any other year as we, we start the scaling up. But let me, call, let me just start with welcoming all of you and thank you for, for attending today. Let me start um, by giving you the current state of the HAT ecosystem. First, for those who have joined us and have not followed us since God knows when, um, let me give you a little bit of a brief as to what we do and why we do it. I put a little snippet here from a chapter from um, but, uh, from Darren Barney on radical citizenship in the Republic of Technology. It's a very interesting quote from a favorite historian of mine, Mark Foster. Mark Foster said, the internet is more like a social space than a thing, so that its effects are more like Germany than those of Hamas. And I, I think it's important to read this, so I'm going to read it out loud. The effect of Germany upon people within it is to make them Germans. The effect of Hamas is not to make people Hamas. As long as we understand the internet as a hammer, a tool that we use, we fail to discern the way it is like Germany. And it is not just the spatial digital characteristics by the, that makes people what they are as more as opposed to what's being used by them, but because the internet is one particularly brilliant technology in a vast constellation of technological devices and habits and systems that comprise a certain way, Western way of knowing and acting or being in the world. Now, the reason this, this little snippet is up is to kind of remind everybody that we are now in that hybrid digital physical space, particularly post COVID. We are now in a space where the digital and the physical realm are merging. Even more so, we have to start thinking of the internet and the digital realm as something beyond just a hammer a tool that we use, it absorbs us. It makes trolls out of us, some of us. It makes um, voyeurs out of us, some of us. It changes the nature of things, some of us. And the way we are changed by it, we need to understand how we are represented within it, how we engage with it, within it, democratically, anthropologically, um, economically, legally. So let me start with, how we see the internet. In the name of service, centralized systems have thrived in this digital realm. This is the service given by many, many services around the whole globe. It is centralized systems because that's how the internet grew up. And they grew up not because they wanted to be centralized, but because technological abilities at that point in time can only create efficiency gains from centralized systems. So in essence, what the internet and what these digital companies are trying to do is to give you a good service. And as they get more and more successful, they go on more and more to provide more and more services because the market wants it, the market demands it, the market competes for it. And yes, they have a ton of privacy and regulatory issues to solve. We're not here to solve for them, but it is something that has grown up with them. Our 4.5 billion internet users today, and that data economy 1.0 that we call it, where data is stored centrally, 
is a one app, many individuals provider centric view of the world. This is interesting, but it's also concerning for those who follow what is happening with global economies, because it is as much as saying, once I take money from you at the door of these centralized systems or build, for example, their, their buildings, then you can't really go on and see what's going on inside. If these number of bubbles start to become bigger and bigger, then our GDP disappears into a lot of these bubbles. Today, you don't buy a watch, you don't buy a dictionary, you don't buy books. You buy one phone and have a broadband and it disappears into whatever services that's giving you all these things. You have one transaction. So the transaction boundaries are very important in the world of which it was very physical and therefore the transaction boundaries is us going everywhere to buy and shop. But in the digital realm, it's now starting to be, the transaction boundaries are starting to be at the gates of these centralized systems. Now, the reason why these are the way they are, the root cause is because as individuals, we do not have the same capability. We do not have the capability of what is considered a first-class citizen on the internet, storage, process, and compute. The root cause is even if you are even if you are looked after within these centralized systems, data regulation can give us only eight rights. Eight rights. Now, full of uh, the full property rights, as you will see, has 13 rights. GDPR and most data regulations can only give you eight rights because it cannot give you full property rights. It lives in the ownership of a technological system that is centralized. Falling short as a result of this, of these full property rights result in even more regulation around data protection. Because of these only eight rights, markets are inefficient and you do not as individuals have entitlements. It is the say it is like a, a, good, a good metaphor would be you're in the building, everybody can see each other and you have no privacy. So guess what the problem is? Try to give you privacy, especially if you're going to a toilet. So maybe we should make some covers for you so that you can have some privacy. This is what happens within the centralized system. The problem space within the centralized system is different because it's a centralized system. And as a result, we start to hear a lot of arguments. It's happening within W3C. It's happening within all other conversations that are happening about who has the right, who should be looking after individuals, what these people's values are, what, why must there be an organization or a group or some kind of community representation because we have only eight rights, someone had better be looking out for us. And that someone would create regulation to do so. For more, if you want to read more about our entitlements, I've written a paper on market design and that's in that link below. What we are trying to do from the hat since 2013, since 2012 and 11, when the seven professors from six universities came together was to really think about how we could give full 13 rights where data flows could be both ways between centralized systems as you as individual, that markets can become more efficient, that there's a combination of you being able to process data and the center being able to compute and process data and that we could be able to emerge an internet that's far more egalitarian than it is currently. So the HAT microserver as a concept it was born, it's called the hub of all things because we believe we should be the hub of all things. This was conceived in 2013 thanks to a 1.2 million pound UK government project. Its vision is enabling equality, justice and freedom in the use of data in the digital realm. It has changed a few times in the past, um, but it has remained steadfastly about the right to contract, the capability to process, and the freedom to choose. The mission, of course, is to place legal representation entitlements for individuals. Uh, now, now, nowadays, individuals are starting to become firms, so micro and small and uh, medium and inter enterprises, as well as large enterprises, so that they can freely enter into contracts online and the creation of markets and services. So the idea of entitlement is super important for the HAT project, it is the fact that you can be represented as a first-class citizen and not a second-class citizen on the internet. Data exchange followed in 2017 with more research funding 
that allowed a micro server, a personal data server, to be able to exchange data to be between um, the the server and the app. This was the power around the time where all my economist friends said to me, Irene, this is dangerous. Stop. This is terrible. Once you create entitlements for everybody, the whole world and lots of people will claim all their data back and they'll just give it away for pizza, which I believe this is probably true. Um, and um, as we know how human beings behave, I probably do that too. The idea behind, therefore, uh, the, the entitlement made us think very closely about what it means to be responsible for the entitlements and the data that you might hold. And we looked around at see some of the, the best cases out there. For some reason, we do that with money. We give all our money away to a company that is for profit. They are called banks. They seem to get away with it. And we, and of course, everybody said, well, that's different. They've got market, market, uh, market, they've got regulation, supervision. Well, let's do that then. So in 2018, not only did we create the age computation or to make a person able to process his own data to come in, the data that's come in within the server. In 2019, we embedded a lot of that legal code and legal rights within the head microserver. The GDPR eight rights became all 13 rights of, a, of owning a personal data server. That includes, in case for all of you who are not so um, geeking out on rights in law, um, right of possession, control, exclusion, enjoyment, and disposition. These rights were uh, established and assured, and I have to thank IQ Capital, which is our first investors who came in as a deep tech investor um, as the, the technology was going into market. In 2020, the data that was in personal data uh, servers or personal data accounts, which are um, the folders within the server, became regulated assets by putting all the governance and policy in place. And the reason we had to do that was to ensure Data Swift as a commercial organization could remain commercial. And the way it could remain commercial, just as banks can remain commercial, was to enter to ensure that the governance and policy was set up so that the contracts entered into between server owners and application could be executed and um, set up by Data Swift without any of the rules, uh, without any of the responsibility or morality that is subjective. And that if there was any subjectivity, it would just raise a risk factor and they would have to kick it up to the Hack Community Foundation in terms of its ethical, uh, its ethics board and its platform rules. The full governance and stewardship of data with clear rules under the oversight was set up in 2020. And that was when um, some of the pilots started. As we went out, we started to look at who would use this? Why was it important? Well, we felt it was important, but today, uh, but over the course of 2021, our academic colleagues within the HAC um, ecosystem, Professor John Crocroft, Professor Roger Moll, Professor Glenn Perry from uh, Cambridge, Ex uh, Surrey and Exeter, um, they have got more than 24, 24.5 million pound grants on decentralization to push the research further. My task, as I, I considered the most unenviable task, was to take it out into the commercial world and get it funded by the market. Today, uh, the, the personal data server is able to be spun out within three seconds for any website that wants to decentralize this piece of data to, to their own customers. We can price it anything from zero to $2 um, under uh, for uh, as an identity provision, and therefore enabling it to be given to the world's poorest, to the homeless, to refugees. Partnership with GoTo, um, thanks to Grabber and TotoQ, enable database checks for a national passport for over 140 countries. If you need that for your own, for the personal data server to interact with your app, it is now fully portable across all borders. When you're giving all 15 rights, uh, all 13 rights, more than what data protection actually gives you today, you'd imagine that is possible. And of course, it's fully compliant with all data regulations um, as they are only um, providing eight rights. 
Today's problem, of course, um, the reason PDSs are out there, and we will hear more about how they're being used, um, are that centralized systems are heaving under the weight of immobile data. We have 120 countries and increasing uh, of data regulations, resulting in data being locked down. The whole privacy and data protection was necessary for centralized system, but has resulted in a massive challenge. Five parties would need 10 legal agreements and 10 technical integrations to be able to move data around. Your data, which is health data in a hospital, now can't be actually moved to anywhere because in, in, the, name of, uh, in the name of protection and privacy. Engagement is slow and costly, and this means it's very difficult for data to create value. We believe the best and optimal solution, of course, is to decentralize the piece of data to be legally owned by the data subject and that they, uh, ensuring that the subject remains at the center. Therefore, you can then only have one single bilateral relationship with your own customers at the center. The data can be brought to different parties by the data subject and data owners. Engagement is on demand, scalable and simple, future-proof with cyber and legal operation. One of the wonderful things about decentralized personal data servers is that it reduces the surface area of attack. If you hack one personal data server, you get one person. As a cybersecurity um, risk, it is also much reduced in terms of incentives. So in 2022, what do we see? What do we see the world today and why is there a need? we have seen a massive growth in e-commerce during pandemic. Lots of people who weren't buying from e-commerce website during the pandemic were selling and creating e-commerce with businesses of their own. Individuals are now becoming firms. Micro and small medium enterprises thrive. They now account for 95% of enterprises and businesses in the world individuals are starting to become companies. And there is a good reason for this. I wrote a paper a few years ago that says individuals will have to mimic firms because as a person who is a wage earner, you cannot be earning wages. You cannot improve your lot in life unless you are having collective bargaining through a union or you become a firm, in which case you can take resources such as technology and capital into your firm and start to grow your little micro firm. And we see that happening hugely during the pandemic. A growth in uh, micro and SMEs, a growth also in customer data. As everybody went online, there's a massive growth in how much personal data was collected about us. And as a consequence, increase in regulation, but also now reduced in targeting capability reduced ability to get more data simply because regulations have kicked in. So in some ways, regulation has been very good for us. It has protected us, made sure that companies who, who collected data did so responsibly and would be penalized if they did not do it. But in, in, other, in other cases, it has just made a lot of our data immobile. What then happens with these micro and small companies? Well, when parts of your data is in two banks, an e-commerce um, um, uh, service, you will find that you have a problem in gaining access to credit. We see the focus on trade finance, credit scoring, and the, the urgency to help micro SMEs, um, a symptom of what e-commerce growth that uh, a symptom of the pandemic um, and the cause and the, the, the consequences of the pandemic caused uh, that resulted in the growth in M, uh, micro SMEs. As a result, data, there's a huge need for data portability, a huge need to try to get multi source credit score for individuals so that they can get trade financing. You will hear much more about it from Ivan when he talks about the different ways he analyzes data portability. Um, in the IFC. In health, there is a rise in NS NCD. NCD, non-communicable disease, 
these are modifiable behaviors, tobacco use, physical inactivity, obesity, unhealthy diet. These are all part, uh, increase the risk of NCDs. What we see in health space, again, a big focus on data portability. I, I'm now in Malaysia where there are hundreds of clinics, hundreds of hospitals and hundreds of labs. A person who has been visited in any of these clinics, labs or hospitals would have their data spread out among them all. Combining them to be able to provide better care, to, to be able to match them to better, uh, better support is near impossible because these are all fragmented companies. The need for data portability can come from decentralized data. The third area, of course, oh, sorry. And of course, you will hear that from Sajuta KG, who will be talking about how they are using data passports and PDAs to solve that within the health domain. Of course, tourism, really one of the hardest hit uh, by the pandemic. Two trillion dollars just in 2020, 2021, or is that 2022? This crisis in tourism is now also compounded by the fact that traveling requires so much data. You need verifiable credentials for everything, vaccinations, PCR tests. The measurement of how effective tourism is, is also dependent on data, which merchants you, you visited. All this data is in a physical, uh, it's, it's spread across companies that are both physical and digital. The need to have greater understanding of merchant transactions, audience behavior in a way that is privacy preserving is also crying out for data portability in a decentralized manner. So these are the three major sectors that we will be covering through the course of today. You will also get to hear from Urban Systems and Wilfred on smart cities. Um, that one is a project that he um, I will leave him to tell you more about uh, for him to make the announcement. Our look ahead for 2022 is that we will be rolling out a lot more personal data accounts and, and starting organizational data accounts for micro SMEs. Our deployment is in 10 countries um, and we are starting to look at special purpose vehicles to fund different kinds of deployments, especially those that are part of the UN sustainability goals. On the R&D, um, John, Roger, and Glenn are doing very interesting stuff in the area of decentralization, the area of digital transformation, identity. Myself, I'm working a lot on data trust, um, as well as um, looking at the data architecture of PDS on chip. Just, just a shorthand for stuff that I'm not allowed to talk about because it's under NDA. In innovation, we are looking at trade finance very, very closely. Um, we are looking at helping micro SMEs being able to grow. Uh, my favorite story is someone who told me about the possibility of being given the personal data server. Um, a person in the refugee camp doesn't have a name, is given a personal data account. He's now called John. From today onwards, he will be called John. With the personal data account, he can identify himself to the next shop where he buys some mineral water bottles. He can cycle around selling them for a profit. He buys a few more things, selling them for a profit. John now has an economic life. He can come back again, buy a few more things. He might get a bit more trade finance. He might get some financing so that he can sell a little bit more without paying back immediately. But if it's, and slowly, slowly, John can have an economic life and slowly, slowly he can build his wealth. And this is one of the most critical reasons why, whether it's John or the person at home selling little piece of uh, children's clothes or, you know, just creating food for others, innovation, uh, personal data server, and what we are doing on the innovation front with trade finance is critical importance. In sectors, we are in four, finance, health, tourism, and HR education. The top reasons for using personal data server as we start to move out and scale out is of course data portability and interoperability. We're the only platform that is able to transform first and third party data into a zero party data through ownership and then therefore licensing it onwards while rewarding 
or whatever it has been licensed forward back towards the source through the data passport system. Um, acceleration of growth, of course, for some of the startups, having a data passport embedded within an app will help accelerate them tremendously because they are able to unlock data portability. And the third, fourth, and fifth are more um, are sort of the uh, the the four other reasons why our apps and our clients come to us. Top regions are Asia Pacific and uh, and USA, and with emerging markets uh, coming up very quickly. Um, Europe is unfortunately not on the list for some reason. The data portability either doesn't seem to hurt, or everybody's very happy with all the data and wealth locked down and not moving them at all. Um, whatever it is, if you are from Europe and you feel that there is an urgent need for data portability to create data, uh, to create uh, wealth, especially for uh, micro SMEs, please come and talk to us. There is also a lot of talk in Europe about interoperability standards. Um, we are all for any form of standards that will move data and create value with data. But I warn and I consistently warn and I still con continue to warn that interoperable standards between centralized systems while it is good, can only be affected and effective if you are a company big enough to have it brought that the cost of it um, and, and built the technology to act on it. Immediately on that basis, you would discount many of the micro SMEs. So while interoperable standards of data is wonderful and it's useful and it will unlock value for data, be aware that it will probably enrich or create, it might create oligopolies and it might enrich uh, larger tech companies. What are the challenges? I think there is still a market understanding of the value of data decentralization in terms of the different business models, the different technology models and the data architecture. I can tell you as a person who have been designing markets and designing various markets using our PDS infrastructure around the world, this is not an easy task. Decentralized mindset is one of the hardest things in the world to have. Um, I used to like to think, um, uh, to make someone think slightly different. I said, do you, we, we, are, we are so accustomed to living in a centralized service world that we forget that when we put ourselves in the center and to have all things around us, that we don't really know how to do it. For example, if you actually walk in to brush your teeth into the, in your bathroom every morning, do you realize you touch six sectors, FMCG, water, electricity, consumable, quite a number of things, but we don't think like that. We don't think of transportation as what that mom is going to put into a car and then drive around and pick up the kids and everything. You think of transportation as trains, planes, automobiles, um, identifying candidates that will benefit from data portability. And of course, from an opportunities standpoint, you can talk to us. I think there are information sent, uh, sessions later on, on what the opportunities are for businesses, um, for their using data passport, for the economy in terms of multiplier from data mobility and for the ecosystem in terms of the scalability of the system, particularly those who are trying to move or scale blockchains and verified credentials. Thank you. And thanks for all the partners in the system. I just want to wrap up with uh, Buckminster Fuller to say that we are not trying to change by fighting existing reality. We're trying to build a new model that can perhaps make the existing model obsolete. And we don't want to make them obsolete. We want to have a hybrid system that could perhaps make the internet work a little bit better. Thank you.